Hi, and welcome to this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. My name is Rob Van Adderkam. Coming up on the show this month, we'll witness the unveiling of the new logo for the UNBC sports teams. We'll report on the presentation of some Aboriginal genealogy research, and we'll even see how some UNBC research may contribute to the revitalization of downtown Prince George. But coming up next, UNBC's connections with the Asia-Pacific region on this episode of Spotlight on UNBC for November 1997. This month, Vancouver is hosting the Apex Summit, and as a result, considerable interest has been paid to BC's role in the growing Asia-Pacific economy. UNBC has had a focus on the region since opening, and has a degree program in international studies, as well as student exchanges in places like Japan, Taiwan, and New Zealand. The academic focus is obvious, given the importance of the Asia-Pacific region to the economy of Northern BC. The fact is that uh, I think you could argue that in a city like Prince George, resource-based city, in a uh, regional economy that's heavily export-oriented, uh, forest products, minerals, etc., uh, on a per capita basis, maybe a per dollar of gross product basis, um, the, what happens internationally is more important to a place like Prince George uh, than it is to most people in Vancouver. That's a statement that's not difficult to appreciate, and examples are everywhere. At Prince George's Pacific Western Brewery, for example, about one-third of all of the beer produced is exported to Japan. UNBC recently hosted a forum for local business to investigate opportunities in the Asia-Pacific region. Given the volume of trade occurring, it's not hard to imagine a lot of opportunities. You look at the size of the regional trading blocks in the world economy now, then this is the percentage of world trade accounted for by the various trading blocks in 1996. Here we see the NAFTA, where if you take the, the total trade shares of NAFTA, it accounts for 18.7% of world trade. The European Union, of course, is the, is the most well-established trading block, what we know of. Um, they account for 37.4% uh, of world trade. The ASEAN countries have their own uh, ASEAN free trade area, uh, a dynamic part of the world economy. They now account for 6.8% of world trade. And then we have APEC, which with its 18 economies is by far the largest trading block, trading group in the world economy. It now accounts for 45% of world trade. One of the northern BC businesses with a share of the Asia-Pacific market is Canadian Woodworks, and company president Arnold Zwiers took part in the UNBC forum. We tend to focus here very much on resource-based products, uh, but when we look at what we do just to support our own resource development, and uh, you know the example I use is Pacific Western Brewery, and, and, and as Brian pointed out, uh, mapping and civiculture, and just some of the support industry, you know, construction. Uh, mine development, etc., road construction, some of the support industry that has evolved around the development of our resource industry, we're world leaders. I think the limiting factor to us, uh, is specifically in the interior of Canada in general, is awareness. Uh, we are next door to the largest single uh, consuming economy in the world. Uh, our natural tendencies are to only and always look south. Uh, we've got to get beyond that. Uh, Canada, with its population base, uh, is, not a, uh, is not a gross consumer. In other words, it's, it, uh, its uh, GDP far exceeds its uh, uh, ability to consume. We have to become aware of the world in general uh, without borders as a trading partner. If we want our economy to evolve uh, beyond the um, uh, the resource level as it is specifically in, in BC and, and in generally in Canada, uh, we have to look at the uh, entire world as a potential customer base. And so the limiting factor is, is definitely awareness. 
Awareness is something UNBC will no doubt contribute to, both in terms of the activities of the professors and the students. We have students going off on exchanges. We have students doing programs like Canada World Youth. Uh, we have uh, uh, other students coming back to Canada to do graduate studies with us who have uh, been working abroad. Uh, and uh, I think all of this adds uh, an, an immediate sense of importance to what's going on out there in the globe to the students who are here who haven't yet done any of those things. And I think the spirit of, of that and these international connections is catching on. One of the students who is sharing his international experience is David Ng, who spent two years teaching English in Japan. Now at UNBC, he is helping other university graduates have the learning experience of a lifetime. I had finished studying about Asia in my undergraduate program. And what you get out of a textbook a lot of the time is completely different than what it really is. And I did find that in the initial stages. Um, so yeah, it was great, you know, learning to develop your understanding of the different culture. A recent information session at UNBC gave students information on the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. Every year about 5,000 people travel to Japan to teach English, making it the biggest exchange program in the world. One of the most important roles for the ALT is to bring a fresh approach to language teaching, to bring new ideas to the Japanese classroom. I've got some good friends who are a family with two young children, and to have young children um, become accustomed to a foreigner is very important. It's what the Japanese government, I think, is important these days. And that's why we go over there, so the students can learn about us. Learn we're not all the same, we're not all stereotypically the same. The reverse holds true, too. Manmohan Singh is president of the International Students Club. UNBC has nearly 70 international students, and half are from the Asia-Pacific region, including Manmohan, who is from Singapore. It's amazing right now because these people start mixing with others. The impact you will have, say, on Canadian students will be, I think they will get an opportunity to learn cultures and the language these people speak and how they live back home. So in that way, that will actually give you some, give Canadians, uh, students here, kind of knowledge that, you know, this is the way it is, this is how it is. If someone comes to talk to me about Singapore, I'm in a better position to tell someone about Singapore rather than someone else who's not been living in that country. So in that way, the impact will be, I think, the level of ignorance that people have might just decrease and people start being interested in it, basically. That's what I feel. An historical event took place at UNBC in early October when a huge volume of genealogy research was presented to the Carrier Sicani Tribal Council. The actual research was compiled by a Roman Catholic missionary team which flies into the remote parts of northern BC. The research will be housed at UNBC and includes hundreds of books containing the names and descendancies of thousands of First Nations people. <laughs> The history of our people is very much um, oral tradition based and the church throughout from their early arrival, the missionaries with their arrival start keeping records of um, births and baptisms and marriages and so on. So this, the record, the compilation of that record into a genealogy has um, serves as an extremely important record for tracing our ancestry back into early times. The genealogy consists of about 270 books, each containing 150 pages. Within those books are the names and descendancy charts of 19,000 Aboriginal people. Edward John and CSTC Chief Mavis Erickson officially received the enormous collection from Roman Catholic Bishop Gerald Wiesner. It was the late Winston Churchill who said, the farther backward we can look, the farther forward we can see. In his wisdom and grace, the late Chief Dan George affirmed, the faces of the past are like leaves that settle to the ground. They make the earth rich and thick so that new fruit will come forth every summer. This genealogy enables us to look 
far backward, providing us also with the ability to see far forward. In it, we see the faces of the past, generating new faces every summer. This work here represents our families. It is in here are the names of our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our great-grandfathers, our great-grandmothers, and so on back to 1782. What we need to do is complete the record as much as possible. Um, it will demonstrate to, to the world the, that, that our people have a place in this province, in this country, that we have a history, that names are attached to a history, and those names are in these genealogies. And um, to, to show at least to, to the early to the early 1700s, even to the 1600s, um, just from oral history, um, our place in, in this part of the province. UNBC had a big open house at the end of last month, which really helped to illustrate the impact that research is having on northern BC. There were displays on everything, like the state-of-the-art science equipment in the laboratory building, to displays on air pollution, worldwide web resources, and superconductivity. This one here is a demonstration of fiber optic communication. We have a, a microphone here. You can speak on the microphone. The signal will be taken in as electric signal, and then change it into optical signal, and then send in a fiber optic cable to a similar unit on the other side. And on the other side, the optic signal will be picked up, changed into electrical signal, and put into the uh, speaker here. So that's great. Here you have a sound source here, which creates sound waves. You go and reflect on this disc here. And the microphone will pick up the signal. And the signal from the microphone is shown on the oscilloscope here. And the, if the distance is the right distance, then you can see the increase in the sound level. And if it's the wrong distance, the sound level will be much less. I move this, increase the distance between the reflector and the, the microphone. You see the sound level is going down. And then at a specific distance, it'll go up again. Here. Yeah. And then once more, goes down and then up once again. So these distances will depend on the frequency of the sound you are using. So if you are standing in front of a mountain and speaking, at a certain distance you'll hear yourself, other distance you will not. We're demonstrating our unique career website that links directly between university programs and degrees to real jobs that have been recently advertised out there on the labor market. By clicking on the cursor here, and we can scroll down here, do another link right here. And for example, if we were interested in, let's say, a degree in biology, we would go over here, pick the biology program. If we were interested in a bachelor's degree, pick the bachelor's level. We would then go down here a little bit, submit it, and we come up with a list of employers. If we click on this one here, this will take us to a real job that was recently advertised asking for a bachelor's level degree in the biology area. It lists the uh, uh, salary levels sometimes of the, the job. It lists the experience they were looking for. It lists us to other links with the federal and provincial government in terms of other characteristics around that type of job. We can also get information on who that employer actually was and where that job was located. As far as I know, no other university has a website which links you directly from a degree and a program to a specific real job that's recently been advertised. The research that I'm involved in personally uh, is uh, archaeological research in the central Canadian Arctic uh, on southeast Somerset Island, uh, just northwest of Baffin Island. Uh, and this is some of the material that, that, that I've recovered from a, a prehistoric uh, Thule Inuit whaling village, uh, about 800 years old, uh, from the uh, central Arctic. Um, Actually, this, uh, this harpoon uh, I collected in the context of some other research on Baffin Island. This is a modern whaling harpoon. Um, uh, you can see a mix of uh, traditional and modern materials. Uh, some of the artifacts you see here are, are 
parts of a, a very similar type of harpoon, but uh, ones that were made 800 years ago. Uh, this little whalebone foreshaft uh, is the equivalent to this uh, copper rod in, on the modern harpoon. Uh, and this little aluminum sleeve uh, had its prehistoric equivalent in, uh, in an antler socket piece. Similarly, the brass harpoon head uh, has its prehistoric equivalent in this uh, beautifully made uh, whalebone harpoon head. Um, some of the casts here uh, reflect uh, uh, another one of the department's strengths, uh, biological anthropology. Uh, Richard Lazenby uh, is our specialist in that area. Uh, these are casts of fossil material um, uh, that reflect uh, uh, the course that human evolution has taken. Um, over here is uh, uh, the elk skeleton that was recovered by construction workers uh, at the uh, Parkwood Mall site in Prince George. Uh, it's been recently C14 dated to, uh, to about 2300 years ago, uh, which is interesting. Although this isn't uh, properly uh, a cultural specimen, it doesn't reflect uh, directly uh, First Nations hunting of elk. There were no cut marks in the skeleton. It was, wasn't associated with, uh, uh, with arrowheads or dart heads. Uh, nevertheless, it does reflect uh, some of the changes that have gone on in Prince George over the last few thousand years since elk don't occur here now. Uh, the Friends of the Elk Society in BC was interested to hear this since they're trying to reintroduce elk. Uh, so it was very uh, satisfying uh, to, get a, to get a date that showed that elk were here when the environment wasn't much different than it is now 2,300 years ago. This is a visualization of an air pollution episode which occurred uh, during February and March 1996. It occurred over a three-day period and during that period we had very high levels of fine particulates. Uh, in fact, they went up as high as uh, nearly 400 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, which is uh, much higher than the provincial standard, which is 50 micrograms per cubic meter. So we were quite interested in figuring out what was happening in the atmosphere during that air pollution episode. So we ran a uh, three-dimensional model of the atmosphere during that time. And what we're seeing here is a visualization of that. On the bottom is terrain. The red dot is UNBC. We're looking from the south towards the north. The Chaco comes in on this side, Fraser's on this side. This is the bowl area right here. The little blue arrows are wind direction and wind speed. And the colorized background here is temperature. And a few things we can pick out. This, uh, this red reddening up here in the mid layers is the subsidence inversion due to the high pressure system, which is like a lid trapping the pollutants down. You can see that developing over time. This uh, change from blue to red near the surface is the daily, daily heating of the, of the air by the sun. So this is really a first attempt at trying to understand what's happening in the atmosphere during one of these severe pollution episodes. These are from uh, the city of Quinell. That's right, statistics, and they're produced by um, British Columbia Statistics. But we have them on our web page, so we can just pull them up for you. And uh, you were interested in Quinell. Yes. So here we have a lot of data on Quinell. Uh, for example, we have the number of tax filers, average incomes, of people in Quinell over years 1991 to 94. Right. Uh, we also have the distribution of income, so you can measure inequalities in income. And on this page here, we have um, all the value, of, uh, some statistics about the city, per se. Uh, it's got total persons and household, um, family structure, two-parent families, single-parent families, those that are run by, uh, by women and those that are run by men. Um, and the value of residential properties. So you get a good snapshot, actually. It's more than a snapshot. It's from this 1992 to 1996 I think it's excellent. information. It's at, at the, at the uh, tip of your fingers, you have all this all on Quinell, and, and you can uh, see what problems it, you may have in that's each community. Right. And, and of course, the way the web pages are organized now, you can, you can pick out any community in British Columbia, Absolutely. and you can take a look at that. Fascinating. And, and Did you, you want, develop this? Uh, the web page was developed by the Child Welfare Research Centre and it's organized so that um, it has hot links for basic information about northern communities. So if you want to know about northern communities, you just come to our web page and it's at your fingertips. What makes the UNBC Central Equipment Lab so special is the number of state-of-the-art instruments that we have. All of, our, all of our machines that you see in this room were purchased in 1994 and 1995. This makes us different from many other universities. If you take the case of uh, the University of British Columbia, for example, their instruments can be, some of them can be 15 or 20 years old. They still, may still be good instruments, 
but they may not be state of the art. They may not have the newest software or the best hardware advancements. Here in the Central Equipment Lab, we do have very new instruments, very expensive instruments, and therefore we're capable of running many experiments. Some experiments, in fact, that cannot be run elsewhere. The cost of, the, of what you see in the Central Equipment Lab is about $2.3 million. This is the scanning electron microscope. This was, um, a, this was contributed by Alcan and the government of British Columbia. The value of it is over $400,000. And what we do is we look at um, soil samples and insects. Right now we have a, we have a fly's head under here. It can resolve um, to seven nanometers in diameter. What's which that? is Seven nanometers. Oh, it's, a very, it's quite a bit smaller than, it's 0 0.000001, or very close to that, depending on whether I got enough zeros, um, millimeters. <laughs> so it's very, very tiny. Um, what we're looking at here is only at 24 times, but this is the X Philips XL30, and it's the first scanning electron microscope that uses just the keyboard. So I run it with a mouse like a, um, like a video game. So the idea behind lie detect detection is that whenever you lie, uh, you get a little bit emotional about that. And when you get a bit emotional, um, things happen in your body uh, and in particular with this thing what we're doing is putting some electrodes on that are going to measure the amount of perspiration on, on the palm of your hand and when you get tense or nervous your hand perspires a little bit and what these electrodes do is they pass a very small electrical current from one to the other and if you're perspiring the current goes through pretty easily if you're not, it doesn't go through very well at all. So we're just measuring how much your skin conducts electricity. I'm going to give you a card, or you take a card. Don't show it to me, OK? I'm going to ask you, was the number one, was the number two, and so on. You say no every time. Don't show it to me. And I'm going to try and guess what it was based on your response. So I got to, basically, I'm going to try to find when you lie and use that as my, my key, OK? Was the number three? No. I think it was two. Ah! It can't be. You fooled me. I have a collection of photographs and slides of Canadian scientists. As you know, I'm, a, I'm an historian of Canadian science. So I've been working on a history of Canadian science in the 19th and 20th century for the past uh, 15, 20 years. And I've... Um, I study mainly women scientists, but of course I study them within the context, larger context of Canadian science, and you cannot study them um, in isolation from men scientists. And what I was trying to do with this exhibition here is to show scientists from different scientific fields, from different periods of Canadian science. And I try to bring it quite up to date, for instance, Jane Mitchell is a, is a young physicist at Carleton University. And, uh, and so, you know, I put in some contemporary scientists as well as some historical figures. And maybe in five years' time, I will include some UNBC people. The UNBC Athletics Department got the chance to show off its new image last month with the official unveiling of the Northern Timberwolves logo. As of right now, the men's and women's basketball teams are the only two official UNBC teams, but the program will no doubt grow in the future. I'm delighted to have uh, members of the uh, men's and women's basketball team here. I'm really, really pleased to see athletics developing at this university. You guys are really pioneers, and, uh, and before long, we're going to be a powerhouse in uh, men's and women's basketball in this province. We're going to be putting on t-shirts, uh, sweatshirts, uh, the same as you'd see it at a lot of the larger universities. And we're hoping that as the program grows, and potentially if we do one day get a national championship, that all the funds that we do raise from the sales of the shirts will go to support the uh, endeavors of our student-athletes to achieve that.
An official rodeo team may be a few years off, but that has not prevented the UNVC Rodeo Club from being one of the largest student clubs on campus. With nearly 50 members, the fledgling rodeo club is quickly gaining prominence, and one of their recent events was geared as an introduction to the finer points of the cow person lifestyle. You want it coming around in front of you, you'll be able to see the tip of your loop crossing in front of your eyes, and you're going to want to line that up on the bale when you're standing just to the left of the bale and just behind the cow, you want that tip to come in just like you can see about 10 inches back. Don't speed it up, just let it drop on. This is probably ideally what we like to do is uh, have the people who know what they're doing come out, put on little displays, little clinics like this, um, get the members of the club, the non-members, the general public interested, uh, getting them out, showing them some skills, um, interacting with, with others who, who have a general or a common uh, interest. Originally, I'm from Vancouver, down south. From a big city, and big now city. you're president of the UNBC Rodeo Club. How do, what do you think about that? Well, uh, I don't know what to make of that. Um, I got farm in the blood. Um, both my parents were, were born on farms. Um, I spent a little bit of time when I was back home on, uh, on farm, but... Uh, up here, it seems to be uh, the natural way things went for me, and just to uh, fall into this groove. I had a lot of fun, almost fell off the horse a couple times, but that's all right. You know, spent lots of time outdoors, uh, you know, growing up, but uh, never, uh, never spent much time around horses, or never really got into the, the cowboy thing at all. And now, are you, are you going to become one? Uh, no, no. Like I said, um, I got the boots, uh, I won't wear a hat, and I won't wear a belt buckle. So this is about as far as it gets. Our initial goal was to have 15 members uh, to be a recognized club. Uh, now we've ended up with some 40 members. So it's, it's taken off, and uh, we're quite pleased, obviously, quite surprised. Horse riding is one of the activities that will take place on one of the main new attractions of the Prince George campus. The Cranbrook Hill Greenway Trail will offer hikers, bikers, cross-country skiers and horseback riders a 25-kilometer trail that runs right through UNBC property. A ribbon cutting for a long section of the trail was held last month. The work that we're uh, celebrating today got done because of some money that came back to our community from Forest Renewal BC. And contrary to what uh, sometimes we hear, this is not uh, any sort of gift uh, from the government or, or gift uh, from Victoria. This is returning to our community uh, some of the rents that companies pay when they harvest uh, forest land, public forest land in our region. And I think this is an excellent use of some of those funds that have come back to our community. How is this as a recreational opportunity for people on horseback? This is great and obviously the trail is in its first year of construction and by the time it's got to the third year the trail surface will be quite a lot different. You know we've got a 10 to 12 foot right of way cleared that's what we'll have throughout the whole thing but we've got to have boardwalks, we've got to have bridges We've got to have benches for those of us that can't make it for long distances without sitting down. So that's where year two and year three from Forest Renewal would be um, really helpful. Thanks for watching this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. Tune in next month to find out more of what's happening at the University of Northern British Columbia.